Welcome to Unfiltered, David Badil. It's a, Hi, James. It's a pleasure to have you here. Normally, and not that there is much of a format, but normally we, we sort of do the story so far and then move on to whatever masterpiece you are currently involved in. But given that your latest masterpiece is quite spectacularly autobiographical, mm. I'm not quite sure... I'm not quite sure how this is how this is going to. It's up to you. Pan out. It's, it's also up show. to you. It's, it's up to yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a dynamic, isn't it? it? Is. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so so let's wait and see. Let's start in Dollis Hill. Okay. Where where the Badil clan yeah. had settled, but your mother. I mean, both both sides of your family had quite um, traumatic backstories. No, my dad not so much. Uh, but your mum very uh, my, much. My, my dad uh, way back. I mean, any uh, immigrant. Any Jew. <laughs> I've tried to avoid the word Jew. <laughs> well, it lasted uh, all of two minutes. I know. It's <laughs> like I get occasional stick from uh, people. I'm going to say anti-Semites, but some of them are just people uh, for, for over-mentioning it. Uh, but I suppose if you are talking about my background, it's quite hard. Yes, this is not true. Not to, and since you brought up trauma, it's incredibly hard. Uh, so, yeah, they both had trauma, but my mum had direct trauma, whereas my dad's was a few generations back. Right. Uh, with my mum, she was born in Nazi Germany and uh, sort of not smuggled out, although I think she was, like, you know, put on top of a train thing, like, where the luggage is. But I think I think it was all... It, uh, well, what I do know is that it took a lot of stuff because basically my grandparents uh, were very wealthy in Germany. They ran a brick factory. I found most of this out when I did Who Do You Think You Are? Yes. I knew a bit of it, but found out more when I did that. They lost it all. It all got nicked, obviously, by the Nazis. And then at the very last minute, basically my granddad was trying to put a thousand quid, which is what you need. It's interesting considering what we have now with immigrants and whatever. The British government at that time were, were asking anyone who wasn't in kinder transport, it's either not a child or whatever, they had to show a thousand quid, a lot of money, obviously, in the 30s in a British bank account before they would let you in. Wow. And my granddad didn't have any money, but he did have some other people who'd got out already. So he'd contacted a lot of them and said, can you just lend me that money, put it in the bank account, and eventually I might get enough money for the British government to let me in. Three weeks to go before the war broke out. I mean, he didn't know that at the time. Sure. But, but three, as it was, it was like a <laughs> race against out. time, yes. as it turned out. He, They did it, and he got the papers and blah, blah, blah. I mean, all sorts of other stuff went on, but sure. basically. Uh, and they got out and arrived in this country with three weeks to go before the war broke out. So that was my my mum, and my mum... How old was your mum when this happened? She was like, well, actually, that's slightly confused. And my, yeah, because my mum has got two birth certificates, right. one of which I think was redone because they were having trouble getting her out. And my This is a very long story, but basically one of the things I investigated on Who Do You Think You Are was that my mum was of the belief that her real parents were not her parents, that her real parents were actually her uncle, who was younger, who just got married. Her mum was quite old by those standards when she had a sort of 40. She thought her parents couldn't have children. And uh, what really happened was that her uncle, who died in the Warsaw Ghetto, I think, there's no actual record of him, uh, my great uncle, Arno, that he was her real dad and, and he had said, look, I've had a baby, but I'm not getting out. You are, take the baby. Now, here's the key thing about that is it's quite a good story and that may be why my mum thought it. Oh, really? My mum, as your, my show demonstrates, yes. was someone who liked a good story and she <laughs> liked a little bit of, you know, look at me, I'm a bit important, I'm a bit glamorous. And she was not beyond definitely using the Holocaust to get that. <laughs> as part of herself, definitely. And I said this on Who Do You Think You Are, but they cut it out. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah that's what it is. It's a little, it's a little arresting, isn't it? Because <laughs> well, well, yeah, literally she said it. So the cameras came to their house. Mm. They lived in Cambridge at the time, my parents. And my mum suddenly said all this. And I said, I've never heard this before. <laughs> I'd never heard it before, but I don't know. Maybe it's true. And then I was off in Poland trying to find out if it's true. But all the time I was saying, my mum might just have made this up. Wow. You know? I've no idea. They cut all that out. That's odd, though. That, I mean, that you wouldn't know. You didn't know much about your granddad's business. You didn't know... I mean, the, the, so it wasn't a story that you were regaled with often then during My childhood. grandparents didn't talk about it much. My grandparents had a really fucking hard time. Yeah. Can I yeah, your granddad around? was interned. Yes, yeah. of course he could. Well, he was interned, but actually interned, no, he liked being interned. Is the Isle of Man was, a, was a relief. <laughs> yeah. No, no, he had a hard time in Germany. For, right. uh, basically, his whole family had been murdered, primarily. That's the, that's the main thing. But also... As far as I can make out from pictures that I've seen, and also when I went, did Who Do You Think You Are, I went to the site of my granddad's brick factory, right. which is now in a place called Kaliningrad, where actually England are playing 
Tunisia, so, I so, think. So, 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 book the seven uh, the secret purposes which is my third novel is about that is about begins with Königsberg but then it got just bombed like by the Russians and by the Americans and next thing you know it's really like a, a devastated place yeah. and I went and found my grandfather's brick factory and it's enormous but it's stumps now. Right, yes. It's so stumps. you get an idea of scale. Yeah, I got an idea of scale of it. And so they were like sort of not aristocratic because no Jews are aristocratic, but they were very successful hope bourgeois people. They lost and they lost it all. And But my grandparents didn't really want to talk about it very much. No, I suppose not. Because it was like very traumatic. Yes. My grandfather was in a mental hospital with depression throughout the post-war period. You know, with depression, right? I've had depression. Mm. And it's a, it's very bad, what I'm going to say, in terms of modern political correctness. Because I am very much of the belief that you can be depressed for all sorts of reasons. And there's no reason why you should blah, blah, blah. You know, But my granddad had fucking good cause yes. to be depressed. Yes. <laughs> you know, straightforwardly had good reason to be depressed. So There's they, probably two different types, though, isn't there? I mean, because the, the, there's the one that is reactive and then there's the one that's chemical well, and then sometimes they'll combine yes yeah, sometimes they'll combine i think that's correct i mean having been there myself I, when i was depressed one of the things i used to feel bad about <laughs> and you can feel bad yes. and be depressed at the same time yes. was i thought i don't shouldn't be depressed i know people with cancer and they're not depressed but what the fuck's wrong rational, with me being rational. yeah but meanwhile he did have proper cause to be sure. depressed and <laughs> uh, he really did and uh, and that had a big effect on my mum well, actually one of the things about my mum one thing about the show is the show is about both my parents, uh, but it's more about my mum. I think people who haven't seen it think it's more mm. about my dad because the dementia thing is a big old hot take and people get into it. But although it is about that, really the show is about memory and it's about how you remember people. And I noticed at my mum's funeral, which was three years ago now, that all these people were telling me how wonderful my mum was. And what I thought bound all these people together was they didn't really know her, right? <laughs> and they were just saying what you say at funerals. Yes. And I wanted to say, well, she was sort of wonderful, <laughs> but mainly she was mental. I mean, really mental. And her biggest thing, the biggest thing in my mum's life, certainly from the time being that I was like, old enough to have a proper engagement with my mother, was that she'd had an affair with a golfing memorabilia salesman but this sounds and like... turned her life over to golf uh, in a very erotic way. And, and, and that is the point at which everybody who's spoken to you about this show suggests that that sounds like something you could have written. Yeah, I didn't. It's I know you did but it, I mean, it is almost implausible. The golfing memorabilia, the affair isn't, but the golfing <laughs> memorabilia salesman but, adds a p p sort of platform of, of comedy. But that's the key element to it, yes. really, which is that uh, when I was depressed, I was in therapy for quite a long time. When was this, David? When I was depressed in my 30s. Right. I, I had proper, I would say I had clinical depression in my 30s. Uh, and I'd, I'd, to be honest, I'd had something like faux depression quite a lot before that, that sort of thing that you might have in your, well, that, not everyone, but I would say I had. Uh, in my uh, sort of late teens, early 20s, which was like a pose of depression. Yes. And then when it entered my life properly, I thought, that's non nonsense. Big difference. So there, there's a really, really big difference. When I was in therapy, she was always talking, the therapist, about, you know, well, the damage that's done by my mum and this affair. Was it Freudian? Uh, no, it wasn't actually. No. It was something called relational therapy, okay. in which the therapist puts their feelings into the room. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, but never mind that for the minute, because <laughs> that's going to lead us into a okay, whole no, other no, area. No, no, yeah, but because a couple trying of, to sound clever. No, no, a couple, of, a couple of times she did put her feelings into the room, and they involved telling me to fuck off. But that's <laughs> that's not the point. The point is that she would often say, you know, you obviously had this very complicated upbringing. Yes. And from a Freudian point of view, it is very complicated because my mum was very brazen about her affair, very keen to tell people about her affair, very keen to tell me and my brothers about the affair because my mum thought it was glamorous in a very 70s way. She thought having an affair was glamorous, right? Yeah. And so when I'm in therapy talking about it and trying to be serious about it, what I always noticed was I wanted to laugh because it was so much about golf, right? right? Golf. <laughs> I wanted to say it's quite hard to be the therapy and really crying and really upset. Oh, yeah, she was oh, far too much. She was too much. It was damaging. No, it was about golf. And it would make me, make me want to laugh. So when I came to write the show, <laughs> the show embraced that. Yes. And it embraced it in a way that I think is positive because it didn't, if you see the show, I don't think you have seen I it. I haven't seen it, no. But it's one thing, it's very much not. It's a, it's not judgmental about my mother. It's a very celebratory show about both my parents in a very, I would say, unusual way. Because I've taken what most people would think, I think, as the stuff you don't talk about yes. after someone's died or got dementia, and said, no, this is who they were. And it's absolutely not good parenting. And it's absolutely probably 
damaging or whatever, but it's fucking hilarious and it's true, <laughs> and that's what I'm going to hang on to, and that's yes. what I'm going to that's what I'm going to say. It's true. It's made me who I am. I am kind of happy with who I am, sure. even through all this yes. shit. So why not celebrate? But look it? at look at what it involved, or look, yeah, look yeah. at the mangle of it's my fun, life. But, but I've comedy, come out the other end. I genuinely believe in in a way that I hope is not you know, uh, over like comedian trying to do an inspirational quote. But I genuinely believe that comedy is a way through. Yes, like My course. process with trolls on, on Twitter is never to ignore them, to try and make a joke about them. Yes. And I'm successful at that sometimes, sometimes less successful. But, but I think if you can make them funny, yes. then A, it's like someone just did that. Someone just, I don't know if you saw that, uh, uh, but I... I was at a conversation. No, I did. This well, I was is at, the Holocaust yeah, reference I was today. A, I was doing a chat at a place called JW3, which is his Jewish venue, with a woman called Devorah Baum, who's mm. an academic who's done a really good book called The Jewish Joke, which is an investigation of what Jewish jokes are. And she told this joke, which I thought was a very beautiful joke, which was a Holocaust survivor after the Holocaust goes up to heaven, tells God a Holocaust joke, and God says, that's not funny. And the Holocaust survivor says, well, I guess you had to be there. It's a brilliant It's a beautiful joke. On, on many levels. On many, yes. many levels. And the level I chose to illustrate, I chose to pull out of it for me was that it says, you know, he wasn't, wasn't yeah. he? Because Auschwitz was the place without God. You know, whether you believe in God or not, sure. it's the place without God. Yes. You know, and that, I think, is part of what makes it a beautiful joke. So there's been lots of responses to it, some from Christians, right? Some from people just being weird. <laughs> some bloke who told me God is not a he or a you're she. Still quite, you're, st it. you're still quite... Your Twitter game is strong, but some of it still shocks you, right? Some of it, you can, yeah. there's a sense of surprise. Well, I've been immersed in it for a little bit longer than you. I yeah, maybe. I mean, you get it as well. <laughs> yes. I mean, sometimes I'm shocked. Sometimes I find, is it possible to be shocked anymore? Yeah, of course. No, I, no. I mean, it's, I'm not really shocked by the anti-Semitism. <laughs> right. Uh, because but no, I was thinking more of the crassness. The, the crassness. The poor quality of well, the anti-Semitism, if you well, pardon yeah. the expression. Well, it's, one bloke. Because there was, I got, well, let's take two examples. I got one just now, mm. which was standard anti Semitism, which was someone who responded to that tweet. Yes. Which has got loads of good responses, yeah, loads yeah. of interesting responses as well. You should never forget there are people who oh, are uh, really majority, interesting and genuine and yeah, appreciate stuff. Yes. But one bloke called something like white resistance, whatever, Natch. start, na yeah, start <laughs> saying, yeah, but. Did six million really die? Check your facts. Holler hoax, right? Holler hoax. But then brilliantly, yes. some people have said, because I, I said comedy workshops are not what they used to be, right? <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then some people have started saying, yeah, holler hoax is not really a very good pun, is it? Because they didn't spend very long on that, but I suppose <laughs> hoax, of course, didn't really work. And then someone else has just tweeted to say it should really be Fowler course, as in F A U X. Oh, so right? strong. And then it said the trouble with these people, these deniers, they spend much more time on denying than punning. <laughs> and you see, for me, that saves that's, everything. That's the correct way of dealing with it. Of course. The correct yes. way of dealing with it is not to say, as some other people have said, I mean, you know, good luck to these people saying it, but this is terrible, mm. so depressing, it's awful. It is all those things. But it exists, yes. and it really fucking exists. Point and laugh, and and I say point and laugh, yeah, because mm. I think that's as a comedian, that is the way of dealing with it. And in a different way, the show does that, which is the show says some of this stuff probably was really damaging. But were it, you doing that as a young man? Were you were you finding comedy in your own situation? Because I mean, off the top of my head, you must have felt aggrieved on your father's behalf. Mm. I mean, that side of it. But well, I possibly am still to some extent. Although you see, that's partly why the other half of the show is about my dad, because my course. dad was in no way so he a was, model dad. My dad no. was an un, and in no way was he a statue. What's that? Sound? Okay, sorry, I thought the police had come to get me. Uh, <laughs> it, my dad was a, uh, you know, uh, I think. But were you the, cracking jokes about your own situation when you yes. were young? You were. Well, so, not when I was with really your young. I don't know when, when it first. This whole scenario Golfing first appeared probably when I was chapter. about eleven. Oh, really? So yeah, it's eleven or twelve. Tough age, mate. Just... Yeah, but I think certainly me and my brothers and my older brother particularly, we did think it was funny. I mean, yeah. we were a little bit confused initially because it wasn't like I'm having this affair and now golf. Right. It was like golf, right? Right? No, you weren't interested in golf, mother. Why are you interested in golf? Yeah. What's happening? And, like, and there's golf everywhere because my mum started selling golfing memorabilia, right? Which would have pissed him off because he sold golf in memorabilia. Right. That's another thing I point out in the show, yes. is that the last thing I think he wanted from this affair was a rival <laughs> in golf in memorabilia. <laughs> but that's what happened. So uh, I think we were confused for a bit, yeah. and then it became clear, because she did used to talk about it a lot, and you know, you know, my brother tells the story, which is in the show, because the show includes film. Yeah. So I filmed my brother telling this story <laughs> about how he was with a new girlfriend called Tracy, and he took Tracy to meet my mum at her stall, 
Golfiana in Grey's Antique Market in Bond Street, which, by the way, was opposite my dad's dinky toy stall. So you'd have thought he might have noticed. Anyway, she's talking to Iva, and then she mentions, mentions this bloke, who's, I'm going to say his name because I mention it in the show yeah. all the time. It's his real name, yeah. David White. She, his name just comes up. And then she turns to Tracy and goes, I've been, I've been his lover for 20 years. And then just carries on speaking to Iva as if she's not said anything of any note, right? And she was always doing shit like that. She, she was glamorising herself then, totally. in the same way as possibly she did with the story of her origin. That's why I, I, I link those two things. Yeah. My, my stereotype of a North London Jewish family, though, would be a, a degree of concern about what the neighbours thought. Yeah, like, but my parents were not stereotypical Jewish really? parents in any way. <laughs> really not at all. No. I mean, that's, I think, one of the things about my previous show that I did... Uh, it was called Fame Not Musical, and that was really a show about how if you've been in British showbiz for a long time, or in any kind of showbiz for a long time, at the sort of level I have, which is sort of like all right level, uh, but not super famous, right, then what you get is a sort of endless stream of sort of mundane shit that happens to you as a result of being slightly recognised, misrecognised, people like thinking you're this and you're not, essentially having a version of yourself out there that isn't you. Yes. And and with me, one of those versions is, oh, he comes from a Jewish family, right. therefore they must be kind of quite wealthy intellectual bohemians from yeah. Hampstead, a bit like the Freuds or something. Yeah. Nothing like that. We but, lived... but not just because of, of, of the of the Jewish North London angle, also because of, you know, going to Trinity to read English and stuff. Kings. A, Kings, I beg your pardon, That's to right. read English. Yeah. There's, a, there's a presumption that you must have... You must have come from that milieu. No, I didn't. And, and, I know you didn't, yeah, yeah. but it's not just they, people see geography and, and religion. It would also be what brought you to their attention was was quite rarefied comedy and, mm. and that kind of... Maybe. Don't I don't you think? know. I, well, I don't know. Maybe. I think it's also to do with like, having glasses <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> it could also and not be being you know, a class warrior as yeah. alternative comedians were in the 80s, which I obviously was not. Uh, but what I always do think about, about you know, being from an immigrant stock... Mm is that you, you don't think of class in the same way anyway. I mean, I went to a private school, but it was a, we, I went there because it was direct grant at right. the time. Yes. And direct grant meant that my dad, who had, had literally no money because he'd been made redundant and hadn't worked for three years, was able to send me there because, you know, he was means tested and that Qualified. meant... Qualified. Uh, but you'd yeah. have to pass an academic yeah, test no, but That's the key thing, yes. is I was, and still am quite, clever. Yes. And being clever meant that I got into that school and then I got into Cambridge and... That kind of aspirational thing due to intellect is an immigrant thing. Right. And actually, when I go and read now, because I do children's books now, to the, if I go to any schools, really, but certainly those schools which are very, like, you know, a little bit academic and pushy or whatever, sure. it's mainly Indian kids now. It's yes. Asian kids. And I think, again, there's that thing with an immigrant community of, like, well, we want our kids to do well. Now, I think if there's still in this country a slightly weird thing with that, yeah. not so much if you're from that background, but if you're from a background that is seen as white, which mm. Jewish sort of is, although right. not by Holohawks, man, <laughs> right? I think it's assumed, oh, well, if he's white and he's going to Cambridge, he must be posh. Yes. And that isn't correct in my case, and actually lots of other people. Be probably more correct 10 years after you left than it was for your journey. It seems to have gone a bit backwards, that notion of mobility. Well, certainly, to yeah. To Oxbridge. Yeah, well, and those schools stopped as well. Yes. I thought that was good. I mean, you know. So probably, you knew you were clever? I knew I was clever. From? Yeah. 11. I guess, Eight, yeah. Nine. I, I mean, did well at school. Yeah. Uh, I was articulate. Were there books in the house? Was it a, was it a literary? Yeah, it wasn't. No, well, my mum, not at all. No, until, uh, she, she, until, didn't... until she got her collection of Nick Faldo golf, memoirs. Golf books. <laughs> yes, and yes. she wrote golf. My mum wrote five books about golf. I mean, she really went all in on it. Oh, God, yeah, I should have brought one. They're called <laughs> things like Golf the Golden Years and, you know, Out on the Links. They're mainly anthologies with right, pictures yes. okay. of, like, ornamental people playing golf. So, school, clever. I mean, scholarship effectively, although it's called different things. Uh, I mean, a means-tested academic entrance. Yeah. Um, it, 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 thinking of the future at all. I mean, just because I'm always intrigued by the, the, the that footlights journey and whether or not everybody turns up jumping onto the stage. I mean, performing. Was that, mm. was that in your blood or was no. that? No. no I, I thought you were going to say that. The same thing, really, as whatever the the image that I've painted of the sort of bookish. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my dad, he did have quite a lot of books, but they were mainly history and science. My dad was a scientist before he got made redundant. He worked for Unilever um, as a kind of middle manager, right. although I think he had aspirations to do more than that as a scientist, but they never really worked out. Um, okay. So we had science books, we had history books. My mum did actually, was keen, and I think it was important for me, on just reading you know, Enid Blyton and yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Um, but 
I, I didn't come from that background. And then performing, in fact, showbiz would, was even further away. Yes. Uh, I remember when I was for my bar mitzvah, I uh, managed to get an electric guitar. Not a very good electric guitar, like a Columbus Stratocaster. Yeah. And it cost like 40 quid or something from a place in Hendon. But I remember telling a bloke at school that I had an electric guitar and he thought I was lying. And he thought I was lying because it was such a symbol of another world, like okay. Top of the Pops, yeah. David Bowie, <laughs> whatever, that the idea that someone he knew could have an electric guitar just seemed ridiculous. And that was as, that was my distance wow. from show. Why did you want an electric guitar? Oh, I, I wanted to be like... Can you, you know, play? Yeah, I can play that. And I was in a band. Uh, well, not then, but when I was 16, I was in a kind of new wave band with a bloke who then went on to be in a band called The Sundays. Have you heard The Sundays? Of course. Yeah, Dave Reading, Gaffrey, writing, The Sundays. And the That's right. He's Harry. my oldest friend. Is that right? He's my oldest Didn't mate, yes. And, uh, and I was in a band with him, and he was like 100 but then, times better But then than me. you're contradicting yourself in a way. Because I'm not. Being in a band isn't... It is. You know what about performing? You mean? Showbiz, being a million miles away from who you are. You've got a guitar at 14 and you're in a band at 16 with somebody who went on to, to, to conquer the hip parade. <laughs> yeah, there must I, have been an impulse. You didn't get oh, no, pulled not, onto the stage. No, no that I, sorry, Joe. I agree with that. What I mean is when I read, uh, I don't know, I can't think of anyone at the moment, sure. but when I read people who, for whom showbiz was properly in their blood, yes. it tends to, you know, like the Red Graves or whatever. Okay. I mean, that's unfair because that's obviously a dynasty. <laughs> but uh, there were people. I'm sure there are people who we think of as stars who, uh, even if they didn't come from that background, right. were performing from a very early age and were fostered to do so. I mean, you know, encouraged to do so by their parents. And there's probably footage of them. I didn't know anything like that. And my parents didn't... What about school plays and stuff like that? Were you... No, uh, although I do remember in my Jewish primary school, I had one line in my school play, which is the most Jewish line ever. This was it. It was well, Rabbi. You certainly do drive a hard bargain. Oh, that was it. And you think you think when you hear that well, the Jewish done. line is Rabbi, but unfortunately it's bargain. <laughs> <laughs> but that was my one line in the school play. I didn't have any uh, school play action in my secondary school at all. Do, do you remember getting a buzz when you were in the band? Do you remember? Was there no sense yeah, of the, the, yeah, the crowd? Yeah, I, I was very interested in music, right? And still am. Yes. Um, and I did play classical piano because I think that is another thing about being from an Im immigrant family is that the one thing that did show aspiration, apart from wanting us to be educated, was that my parents were sort of obsessed with classical music, certainly my mum. And that may have been the German thing mm. because her dad was like a big Wagner fan, even though Gosh, yes. he was like, you know, had good reason not to like Wagner. Mm. Um, and so I learned classical piano um, and then I taught myself the guitar. And as my big rock and roll punk rock statement when I was 16, I went along to my grade seven and I deliberately played the wrong, one wrong note. I was going to say all the wrong notes. So it was one wrong <laughs> note throughout a piece. That was my big Ted Grundy Sex Pistols moment. And I failed grade seven. Um, and But before that, I'd gone to quite a lot of classical concerts without really understanding it or liking sure. it. Um, and so I For guess... duty. Me, yeah, of, well, it was more than duty. It was Some a talent. thing that you have as a kid. I don't yeah. know if you had anything like this where... You're trying to find out who you are. Yeah. And in my case, my parents slightly decided to, certainly my mum, fill that in for me. So okay. she wanted me yes. to be someone who liked classical music. Mm. She also wanted me to be someone who liked books. And she was right about that, but she wasn't right about classical music. And I still have problems with classical music, which I would like to like. Yes. But as soon as I hear it now, I feel like that 11-year-old who was dragged along by my grandfather to see Daniel Berenboim at the Royal Festival Hall or whatever. Yeah. But anyway, I like music and I wanted to be in a band, but I don't feel that as showbiz. I, 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 I think if you were... A, well, that's because you were, you were musical. You didn't want to be in a band to get laid. You wanted to be in a band well, to... Well, I, you'd no have doubt, desperately wanted yes, to get laid. But I was, that, I was you didn't a join band. a band just to do that, which is what no, I No, I didn't even... I wasn't even a band. I wasn't a singer. No. So, you know, and I was like, just wanted to be in a band because I like music. And it was 1979. And I think if you were 16 and, and had an electric guitar and sure. some mates, you were yeah. in a band. Yeah, exactly. You know, but I, I didn't have any big performing thing. I wasn't like, you know... People who say, oh, I went to Anna Share, you yeah. know, I did all that. I didn't do any of that. So when did you discover? Because I, I presume... No, there you... was a thing. There was a thing, uh, which was kind of weird. Because I... Well, there was... The key element, key moment for me was my brother playing me Derek and Clive. That's the key moment. That's when I thought, I want to do this. Yes. Uh, I want to be... <laughs> but the De Derek and Clive is weird, though, because that's very into It's tapes that yeah. you can... Most people listen to on small, old-fashioned tape record. It's not. It's not... Stadium stuff. It's no. not. It's not audience. Well, stuff. It's a very intimate. Yeah, but comedy. remember again, we're talking. You know, seventies, 
you know, when did I hear that? Probably when I was 14. But I don't so think of Derek and Clive as necessarily being performance art. It's it's closer to... I think it's really... It's very high comedy, in my it, opinion. Yes, but it's, close, it's closer to eavesdropping. Isn't Maybe, it? but I think... Don't, don't forget what I'm saying is... In Britain, certainly, yeah. and this is before the internet, so there wasn't much seeing of no, American comedians no, that sure. can happen. Yeah. You're looking at Jasper Carrot, Billy Connolly, and then a bunch of fat men in bow ties who aren't funny. Yeah. So, it's and I did, and I really like Jasper Carrot and Billy Connolly. Of course. Then, uh, but it still didn't probably speak to me in the same way as Derek and Clive did. Who are absolutely filthy, yeah. but also incredibly sophisticated yeah. characters for people who don't know created by, by, by Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. And your yeah. brother presumably brought this to you with a real sense of excitement and said, David, you've got to check this. Yeah, this yeah. he had a cassette of it, of uh, Derek and Clive Live, yeah. and it felt very secret, even though my dad was the swearest man in the world and would probably have loved it and probably did hear it, I don't know, but it still felt like we were listening to this in my brother's bedroom yes. secretly. And what I still think about Derek and Clive is, and what I still love about it is there's a liberation in it of like, we are just going to say the first thing that comes into our heads. Yeah. We are two incredibly yeah. funny men, yeah. so it's going to be funny, but it's going to be no censorship, no inhibition, whatever. And then they start egging each other on. they start on. egging each other on, so and they're drunk for a lot of it yes. and all the rest of it. And some of it isn't funny, and no. some of it probably is unacceptable now, all the rest of it. But at the time, I think this is like poetry. It's like comic poetry. People have said punk. Maybe, mm. maybe. But either way, there's something that I really love about it, which I still I think is important to me artistically, which is it's got a deep comic authenticity to it. It's people who aren't thinking, oh, how should I be funny? And yeah. what's the prevailing thing in uh, that I should be doing to try and catch, you know, whatever thing it is that I should appear as comic? No, I'm going to go to the sort of id of comedy that's in me and I'm just going to bounce out what's in there. And that felt so funny and unbelievably funny. And then what happened was about uh, a year after that, so I was interested in comedy, my school review happened. And uh, my school had a sketch show, a review, which happened at lunchtime. And every year it was rubbish. I mean, without fail, terrible. It was like songs and... I mean, my school wasn't a posh public school. It sure. was a bourgeois public school, yeah. private school. So it was mainly kids from North London, quite a lot of Jews. They're not posh, but they're some of them are quite rich. Mm. Uh, but for some reason, it had... Like a maybe like all petty bourgeois schools do, and they try to aspirate and try to be like a public school. Sure. So, for example, I arrived there; they don't play soccer. I was always really fucked off about that. Yeah, same because, at my school, which yeah. was a proper public school, uh, was but it? it was a snobby thing to yeah. play rugger. rugger yeah, rugger, but rugger, that's rugger, wrong rugger. anyway because Eaton and Harrow I, play yeah, soccer. I know, I know. You know, I know. so I was always really pissed off about yeah, that. Me I think too. part of that was this show; they had songs about you know, I don't know what a lovely place the school was as if it was like yeah. a place that you punt at. Yes. Right. So yes. Yes. so there's all that happening and it's rubbish and every year no one's interested and people just talk throughout it. Then for some reason that I still don't know, I got asked to write it with this other bloke called Nick and I decided what we're going to do, which is what surely kids want, is sketches about the teachers. Yeah. And they were very, very strong sketches about the teachers that we wrote. This is your final year? Or? My final, well, right. at that time you had to stay on an extra term to, to do, do Oxbridge. Oxbridge. Yes. So I was in my, about to do that. Sixth term. Yeah, I was in my extra yeah. term. And that that was the people who always put it on. It's called the 6S oh, yeah. yes. Review. Okay. Right, so I do, uh, so I write these sketches, which include, for example, the librarian, who I remember was a very strict and unpleasant man, but also a Christian, we had him having sex with the library assistant, who was a woman, but she was a blow-up doll in our thing, on the photocopier with the sketch involved boys, you know, making photocopies of it while it was going on. Gosh. You know, we had another sketch whereby I, I was the music teacher and I came on and he always used to do this in assembly to try and get people to sing the hymns, but I just swore at the audience, trying to fucking sing, right? And it was like that, and it, I still think, I mean, I've, I've let's be self-aggrandizing for yeah, a minute. Yeah. I've stormed some gigs, yeah. but it may be still was... amongst the best response I've ever got. Because I no mean, one could believe what they no, were No, no one could believe it. I mean, they really, I mean, the kids went mental for it. <laughs> it really went through the roof, and it was supposed to be on like, all week, like every lunchtime. It was immediately taken off by the school. I was immediately taken to the headmaster's office, and they said, right, we should expel you, but because we want you to go to Cambridge, and mm. they didn't say this, but what they meant was, we are aware of our league tables. So we're <laughs> we're not going to expel you, but you're really bad, and blah, blah, blah. And, and that was great, because it meant I didn't get expelled, but I was suddenly cool yes. at school. For, Had you but, not been cool not before? especially. I was a much cooler people than me. Were I you mean, popular? I, I was all right. I wasn't, like, you know, uh, like really hated at school. Sure. I'm actually, just to tell you, uh, and I don't think I'm going to forget this, I'm going to start another story, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a heckle, uh, famous heckle, which has been put down to me. People think it's me, 
it was heckled at, but in fact it's not me, it's I, me who told the story. Right. And the story was there was a, a, an open spot at the comedy store called Cynical Sid. And Cynical Sid goes on stage and he's doing really badly and he's kind of like, it's obvious, Cynical shouldn't even be on stage, mm. he's kind of like very awkward and whatever. And then eventually, someone at the back shouts, everybody hates you, everybody hates you, you must know from school. Right? Which is a brilliant yeah. and devastating heckle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I've noticed when I've seen people occasionally talk about the worst heckles, they say, this is a heckle that was said to David Baddiel. And it often makes me think, <laughs> oh, people must think I was that bloke <laughs> oh, at school. No. But I wasn't really, but <laughs> nor was I, I was sort of an in-betweener, nor was I incredibly popular. I just, sure. you know, hung around with my friends. But, after the success review, you were Peter Cook and Dudley Moore Peter rolled Cook into and one. Moore, yeah, <laughs> and that made me want to be a comedian. Then did it immediately? I mean, you just thought, yeah. Christ, I could do this for a living. Yeah, I don't know about a living. I just thought that I is could brilliant. do a lot more. It's, well, it's really a good feeling, is what yes. I thought. But it's never, really... you never, because Matt Lucas was here a couple of weeks ago, and he he went to my school, of course. Yes, yes, but he didn't go to. He started university and dropped out, I think, because the career, the comedy stuff started happening right. for him. Did yeah. you, did you, you would not have contemplated not going to Cambridge? Well, I not? went to Cambridge yes. because I knew about Footlights and I knew about oh, Peter Okay, Kirk. really that much? Oh, totally, yeah. Gosh. Now, I, I was going to go to Sussex or, or Stirling for some reason because I was very interested in literature and the thing I would have done had I not been a comedian is be an academic uh, in literature. That's the other thing. You'd started doing. your PhD. Well, later on. I know, at UCL. obviously, after yeah, doing yeah, but, but... I, yeah, I, did a, I did a PhD. Well, I did a whole... I did. I virtually finished it. Well, three years at UCL. Yeah, well, I didn't. I, I, the last minute, I thought, actually, you know what? I seem to be doing all right as a comedian. But let's have we fast-forwarded. That's my fault. Yeah. So you got you got there, much more interested in the... But no, you must have still enjoyed the academic side of it. No, I did. Up, yeah. No, I did. Um, well, it was... You had the it, best but of both I, But it was a slightly weird 80s thing as well, which is... I wasn't sure about going to Cambridge. I was very left wing at the time. Right. And I thought, oh, is it a bit, you know, wrong to mm. go to Cambridge for whatever reason? Uh, I should go to Sussex, which was kind of a very right on place, or okay. Stirling. They had a brilliant English course. But then at the last minute, Footlights. And at that point, I had been to the comedy store and yes. I'd seen the start of alternative comedy, but I still didn't really understand, oh, that, that's a way of being a comedian. Yes. So I was aware of Python, obviously, and Peter Cook was a massive hero. And so I went to Cambridge, yeah, to be in Footlights. And what sort of people had you seen at the comedy store? Who, who uh, were the early? Uh, Tony you... Allen. Okay. You know, Tony Allen. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. And I remember a comedian who I had a discussion with uh, just recently on Twitter called Ian McPherson, who the previous discussion I had with him, we'd had a fight. Uh, <laughs> and we made it up on Twitter the other day. But anyway, he's an Irish poet comedian. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember anyone else. So you knew that things were changing. And so yeah, you although... weren't going to go to Footlights and start doing Oscar Wilde sketches? Well, or... well, well, actually, I mean, this is a whole other thing. But when I, start, when I was in Footlights, I was doing stand-up. Yeah. I, mean, I wrote sketches as well, but I was doing stand-up because I'd seen enough to know this is what I want to do, not the sort of character monologue, blah, blah, blah. Got you. Um, and then when I came out of Footlight, it was a weird thing because, and this still happens a lot as well, there was a period of about four years when being in Footlights was about the worst thing you could have done. Because of the rise of the edgy yeah. lefty. Because of the rise of, you know, when you see... They free... took the piss out of this in the young ones, yes. didn't they? Yes, when yeah. you see that young yeah. one sketch yeah, yeah, yeah. where it says something like, Wankers College at with, with Steve McFry and Emma Thompson, College? something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Tosser's College, Oxford. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes, and yes. it's all very well for Stephen and Hugh, who, by the way, were, had made it by then and yes. could very happily be in the self ironizing sketch line. like that. Right, but if you'd come out Footlights in 1986, <laughs> which I did, and you rang up the comedy store yes. saying, I'd like to do a gig, please, and they would say, OK, have you had any experience in comedy? And I would say very proudly, yes, I was vice president of the Cambridge Footlights. They'd put the phone down. Think, They'd put really, the phone down. Away. And I'd have to ring them back and say, no, I haven't had any. I'm a different bloke. So violent reverse snobbery. Yeah, it was a really violent first time, which by the way completely I often get accused of like being part of the Oxbridge Mafia yes. who just got I was like of no use whatsoever because it was quite a small window it wasn't oh, no, it? Then, I mean, then it changed again because it got Mitchell and Webb oh, no, and no, back, then it changed back to again. that I mean, so you, you just were right in the middle of yeah, the worst yeah. period ever to worst be a worst period ever and actually luminary. I am one of very few people who got any success in comedy from that particular period I didn't know there's, that there's one or two others makes perfect like sense Nick Hancock yes Punt and Dennis, uh, but around that same period, but really very few. And then it changes, and you get Mitchell and Webb, who, yeah. by the way, are brilliant. I, well, of course I should are. stress. I don't, I don't think they're no, don't where worry, they are not. just it's because of clear, that. It's clear where you're coming from. Yeah, but you, you just you just got washed up on a on a on a on, yeah. on a so beach. I was, but I was, I just started again, really, and I went and did the London Cabaret Circuit for five years. You, so you weren't your Spurs, were you not? So Punt and Dennis, you mentioned. You weren't collaborating with them at this time? No, uh, no. The Punt and Dennis were people I knew, right. but we were put together, actually. Me and Rob Newman and them were put together by Radio 1. And for the Mary Whitehouse experience? Yes. Yeah. 
And did you know Rob before that? I'd met Rob at Cambridge. Rob doesn't sometimes tell people he went to Cambridge, but he did. But he wasn't in Footlights. Okay. He was this... One of the things about Cambridge, I, I can't speak for Oxford, I've never been sure. you, is you don't just get, as I say, posh people there. No. You also get strange, interesting, unusual Absolutely. people like Rob Newman. So yes. Rob Newman had come from a, just a sort of underprivileged background uh, somewhere near Stevenage he's from. He'd had mm. a very rough childhood, Rob Newman, and not got anything like the qualifications he needed to get into Cambridge, but was clearly very bright and interesting and talented and had ended up in an interview and a place called you know, Selwyn College. Mm. And the person there had just thought this is an interesting and talented bloke and given him a place. Now, I think that's good. Yes, I do. You know, but I don't know if it uh, happens anymore or whatever. But he was like a maverick. Mm. And he. I met him there. To be honest, I don't quite know what happened to Rob's Cambridge career after that. I met him in my first year. Then I'd heard he'd gone to live in Toxteth, okay. uh, which he had. Uh, I don't know why. It's not very near Cambridge. No, it's, um, it's quite uh, a commute. Yeah, it's quite a commute. <laughs> uh, and I think, I don't know if he dropped out or what. But then I kept on bumping into him in London on the circuit. On the circuit right. and so he was doing stand-up as well. He was doing impressions at the time. Okay. Yes, of course, because he did special actually, image, didn't he? And, yeah, but yeah. what I remember most clearly about Rob uh, very early on was uh, I think me and him had just started writing for Week Ending, which was this show on Radio 4 that you could just rock up and... and Send in jokes. And a, but you, more importantly, you could go to the meetings. Oh, okay. They had an open-door policy on anyone can come to these meetings. There was the commission writers meeting yes. and the non-commission writers meeting. And the non-commission writers meeting was full of nutters. But also it was where if you could write comedy, you got, you know... Would you take something like that in your stride or would you be throwing up beforehand in the loo? Or non commission writers between. meeting. Yeah, just just because... Oh, no, I'll be all right with that. Would you? I, I was very nervous before I uh, started doing stand-up properly. On stage? On stage, yeah. So the audience could be intimidating, but not the sort of rarefied corridors of the BBC with this wonderful heritage of... No, good. well, to be honest, it didn't feel very rarefied. Did it not? The, the writers, the non commission writers yeah, meeting still, was mainly I mean, tramps. Right. So <laughs> Just getting a warm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think quite a few of them were just tramps. Um, and But one thing I remember at Rob is that I've seen him a bit, and I was a little bit wary of him because it had this maverick, slightly mad time in Cambridge. I'd actually done a film, a uh, short film, terrible short film, <laughs> with him in it, yeah. and then it vanished. So I thought, well, like, I'm a bit worried about him. Yeah. Is he all right? But then he had some funny ideas, and we ended up writing together. And then he hadn't really started doing the cavalry circuit, but he did an impression for me of Jonathan Ross. Mm. And I remember at the time thinking, bloody hell, Jonathan Ross has only just got on the telly. This is a brilliant impression. And the idea then, it might seem odd now, the idea then that you could be an impressionist and not do Frank Spencer oh, and Harold Wilson and or Margaret whoever. Thatcher. Like, yeah, the yes. bank of Mike yeah, Yarwood yeah, yeah. impressions that everyone who could do impressions seemed to do. Yes. That you could do modern people like Jonathan. Yes. That just struck me as like amazing. And it, I know it doesn't sound it now, but honestly, it does. No, it does. It, it, no one was doing impressions like that. It was uh, there's another guy, Phil Cornwall, yeah. started doing that as well. But only him and Rob were doing these kind of like, oh, these are new people with yes. voices we haven't heard, yes. you know, impressioned and exaggerated before. So he'd start doing that. And were you simpatico? Did you did you yeah. strike up a special friendship because you're writing together? Or I don't know if we were. We did strike up a friendship. I mean, me and Rob, you know. But you uh, weren't a double act, in any, except as a uh, writing team. Well, I, you know, strangely, I, I don't know if I've ever been in a double act as such. I've worked very closely and been on stage with and on camera with two other brilliant comedians. Yes. But we've never been a double act like Reeves and Mortimer. No, I know. I know. A double I, act. I, I, I don't do. think. I think, and particularly with Rob. Yeah, with Rob, we were writing together and we created. The Mary White's experience with Bun and Dennis together and characters within that, but we were also doing separate stand up and you know, where we used always it, having yeah. your, 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 your own yeah. avenues. How, how ambitious were you at this point? I mean, five years on the circuit means you're doing it at least in large part for love, yeah. But were you did you well, have your eye on glittering that's not prizes? True, actually, James. Is it not? I mean, I was doing it well, love is an odd word because the circuit was rough yeah but you loved days. doing it well I, I didn't always love doing no. it no sometimes it was fucking horrible <laughs> but within a year i was comparing the comedy store oh okay so uh, you... and i still remember and i still think of it as one of my proudest moments yes. and i've had a lot of stuff but sure. i remember kim kinney who used to run the comedy store coming into the dressing room and saying to me i think we'll move you up to compare next week wow. just in a very throwaway way deliberately sort of like sure, you know, sure, and, sure. and i was so happy about that because right. it was really an honor and it was Difficult but brilliant if you got it right because yes. the audience were really on the side of the compare, yes. and you got paid four hundred quid for the night even then. Yes, you know, so that so that was money. suddenly like because I needed money because yeah. I didn't have any money at all. Sure. I was on the dole. 
apart from when I was earning them. Oh, fuck. Uh, you know, yes, some course. of the time. Uh, They're not going to come for you now. I, yeah, I didn't have any money. <laughs> uh, and I was just living at home with my parents who really wanted me to go. It's not like now where you sort of want your kids. To, they just wanted me out of yeah. there. So that was when I could start to have a job. Who yeah. did you ring? Who do you go to first with that news when you got that amazing news? Who, who, who in your life at that time would have been the first person you called? Uh, well, it was probably my girlfriend at the time. Janine, what this? Janine Kaufman, uh, who was my girlfriend at the time. She, uh, probably her, or my brother. I lived with yeah. Ivor, my brother, for quite a long time in a flat in Kilburn. Um, and because Kilburn, uh, this goes out all over the world, I imagine. Yes. But Kilburn, I used to live. And one thing about doing the comedy store in the 80s, in Kil when you lived in Kilburn, is that I came back on the night bus quite a lot. Yeah. And I remember the first night that I'd done two uh, late nights at the store. Uh, so I was coming back like, two o'clock in the morning or something on the night bus. And looking outside, I thought, oh, there's a riot going on. This will be on the news tomorrow because there's like burning bins and people chucking each other into shops and stuff like that. And then I realised, no, that's what happens every Saturday night in Kilburn. It's just going to be like this. And I think it still is. I right. think it's resisted gentrification. It's just Queen's Park stops and Kilburn begins. Yeah. It's, it's very, you're not, not a line that you, you cross without your wits about Yeah, you. but probably my brother or my girlfriend okay. at the time. So, and then... Uh, not my parents, strangely. No, that's why I asked. No, I, wasn't, well, one thing about my parents is... Again, it's very key a part of the show, but the sh the, the, my parents were very 70s parents in mm. that, in lots of ways, the sex, all that, but in a very specific way, which is, have you got kids? Yes, yeah, two girls. Okay, so I think the key element of our generation is we have we stop our lives, we're I mean, not completely, but we stop them where we need to stop them for our children. Yes. My parents did not stop their lives for us. No. They carried on doing their mad shit. In the case of my mum having an affair, in the case of my dad just swearing a lot and generally not noticing that we were there and just carried on being totally themselves. They did not think, oh, actually, I've had kids now. That sort of means I've got to change yeah. who it's I am. It's an amazing shift yeah, in the space it, of two it's generations. It's a massive shift, I think. I mean, for me, the only thing that has changed who I am properly is having children. Because sure. I am absurdly, kind of wearingly myself in all situations. And I think, like, fame and all that stuff, it's all been great, yeah. you know, but hasn't really changed who I am. Having children has changed who I am in right. a good way. Made you more... Made me more uh, empathetic. Yeah. Made me less thinking about myself all mm -hmm. the time. Maybe actually, as it were, physically or metaphysically, whatever the word is, see the world from someone else's point of view. Think about them first. Instead yes. of having like a reflex thing like, oh, fuck, how does this affect <laughs> me? I do think, well, how does this affect them? You know, yes. and, the and, and be really... like. But I don't know if my parents... Had that, and one of the things about my parents is my mum really liked the fact. I think when I got famous, that I was famous and was always first there, and there was a premiere or anything yeah. like that. But not in her whole life did my mum say to me, "Oh, I like that joke. That's an interesting joke." Oh, yeah, but nothing, never. My dad a bit more because my dad was a really funny bloke, but yes. he, at some level, wasn't bothered either. So the idea of calling them would wouldn't not be it, wouldn't have happened. No, it's sort of desperate to prove that it was working or, yeah, or but seeking I, oh, approval. When did you think you were famous? When when would you first have? Probably about six months after it was true, you'd have first felt even vaguely comfortable describing yourself. Well, in, in, in Fame Not the Musical, which was the first show, I, mm. I spent a lot of time talking about the awkwardness of talking about being famous, yes. particularly at a time when I was less famous than I used to be. That's what I talked about in that show. I yes. said, I'm going to talk about being famous, that's going to be complicated, and then I'm going to do something even more complicated, which I'm going to be talking about less famous mm. than I used to be. And I was saying the famous don't really like to talk about being famous, but they really don't like being, talking about being less famous than they used to be. So I wanted to talk about both those things, because I'm interested in talking about stuff you're not meant I'd to talk about. I saw you on Jonathan Ross a few years ago when you were clearly struggling a bit with the sense of not being on top of the game as you had been previously. I don't know, I was struggling with it. I was, oh, I was, I know the show you mean. He ended up. You seemed quite sad that night, I thought. No, not really. Uh, do you no. mean the one where I I take over the show because he goes for a piss? Yeah, I think it was that one. But you kept referring to, no, I to having to peaked. Yeah, I but that isn't sadness. That's me needing to say that. Got you. Uh, because of my sense of like, I. Jonathan had me on yeah. at a time when I wasn't doing anything. That's right. I was sort of like, I think I was starting to think about doing stand-up again and I was writing, but he just said, oh, I, you know, I think probably someone had dropped out. Mm. Oh, do you want to do the show? I said, yeah, all right. And I made a point of saying, you know, normal people come on to say, I'm doing this amazing TV show. I, you've got me on when I'm not doing anything. Yes. And then I, I wanted, I think it's a need that I have always to confess, and well, and I will always confess something negative, because yeah. I, I think that that's sort of an exorcism of the negative thing, and there might be funnier. Sometimes it works. Because you used to... it didn't work completely for that that for you, because you thought it was slightly sad. No, just, just, yeah, I did. I thought. Whereas I, I wouldn't have thought it was sad. I would have thought it was honest. Yes, we could be both. Just, but I suppose there's something See, sad about losing 
status. I suppose, yeah, but maybe it possibly. was me. Maybe I was projecting onto you and I felt yeah. sorry for you, whereas in fact you weren't struggling with the loss of <laughs> status at all. But this is also the pornography thing you used to. You used to talk about pornography. Yeah, well, I talk uh, about anything. That's confessional as well. Yeah, well, I talk about anything that I think is happening to me and that I think people don't... I don't... To be honest with you, I don't think I think, oh, what is it that people are not talking about in a yeah. kind of, uh, you know, um, controversialist sure. way. Uh, I'm not trying to do that. I think that I genuinely try and talk about the stuff that I think I want to talk about. Yes. One of those would have been probably at a time pornography. Now I don't feel the need to talk about it as much, no. not because I don't use it anymore, but because it, fe it feels like something that's been talked out. Yeah, fair to enough. Some extent. Although, but again, me, it was a taboo. That's well, actually, why well, I mentioned it. Let me tell you it. something that hasn't been talked about, about pornography, which I, if I do ever talk about it again, I, this is what I will say, because mm. actually I got asked by someone at Channel 4 to do a thing about pornography, um, uh, about internet pornography, about how I feel now, yes. having talked about it a lot when I was younger, having a kid, you know, blah, blah, yes, like a course. boy who might be looking at it or whatever. Yeah. And I sort of said, oh, I wouldn't be interested very much in the sort of like, oh, I've changed my mind about it, whatever, uh, even if I have a bit, because this yeah. is actually what I think. What I think is that internet pornography, no doubt, is harmful in a thousand ways. No doubt it is. But it's done one good thing, which is really good, uh, which is when I was growing up, pornography was essentially heterosexual pornography, just one image of a woman. And it was sort of a 22-year-old, probably blonde, sort of woman with enhanced breasts or not, whatever, incredibly thin Etc. That was really all you saw in VHS pornography or magazine pornography. Now, if you find erotic uh, an 87-year-old, you know, mixed-race amputee who's 27 stone, she's out there, and not only is she out there, there's a whole fucking site devoted yes. to her and all her mates who look the same, and no doubt feminists, and I consider myself one in, uh, you know, in my own way, but no doubt it will say, oh well, that's just her being degraded. I'm not sure about that. What I think internet pornography has done is democratise the erotic mm. and smash apart to some extent that incredibly oppressive hom homogenous idea of what an erotic woman is and say no really very very unlike that women are going to be found erotic by lots of people and no doubt men as well and I think that's a good thing there's and lots of shit stuff I'm sure it's done as well but I think that's a good thing have you listened to John Ronson's new podcast on this the butterfly no. effect you'd enjoy that I think okay so it's a, a, a big recommendation okay I've always thought that the use of women and the use of women's bodies in mainstream stuff so in newspapers uh, obviously page three but also I did recently got into a thing you might have seen on Twitter where I attacked the times mm. for posting uh, uh you know i posted this thing where they'd use two women in bikinis to say that the ashes had started it, yes. and my point was not you shouldn't have women in bikinis in the newspaper or that i don't like looking at women in bikinis in some kind of puritanical way my point was this is what's bad yes. what's bad is this is treating women as objects yes in my opinion more, much more than pornography which is, has an honesty to it i think it does have an honesty to it and as i say Trust me, you will not see in the Times or indeed on the side of a bus an 85 stone, you know, mixed race amputee. You won't. Well, wait you till. will see. <laughs> you, you will see it in pornography. Yes, it's true. Um, and that that I kind of need to steer you back slightly. So you probably time right. No, not at all. Um, because For I don't want to safety. I don't want to spend a lot of time looking at uh, the, the Mary Whitehouse experience and then the then you and Rob Newman going off to do your own thing together. I mean, the first rock and roll comedians was the thing. You played Wembley uh, Arena. You, you, you were huge. Just, what was that like? I mean, did, did you, were you just caught up in it in such a way that you didn't have to? Because you like to analyse stuff. I just mm. wondered whether this, because it didn't end happily with you and Rob Newman, mm. was this the period of your life where you didn't analyse stuff? You were just on a sort of, on rails? Um, no, I did analyse it. Were you constantly? Yeah. Uh, I wasn't happy for some of that and I was really happy for for other bits of it. What? The first bit of it, I mean, in terms of your question before, mm. I would say it was me and Rob had done a first series of Mary White's Experience on the telly and yes. we were doing a, a live gig at the venue. Now, as I said, I've been on the cabaret circuit for like, I don't know, five years, so I was used yeah. to just rocking up at a comedy gig and no one really knows who you are and you have to win the audience round and who knows how many people are going to be there. Mm. There were queues around the block at this place called The Venue in South London. Mm. It was a 900 seat venue. They couldn't get everyone in and I'd never experienced that I'd never experienced and it hadn't really occurred to me that being on telly might do that obviously it might but it really hadn't 
occur to me that suddenly live gigs might be something that people will come to and be fans, like really fans. Um, and that was what happened. And that was when I, I realised, oh, fame has a tangible thing as a comedian, which is you can go on stage and people will like you already. Yes. And actually, that might lead to complacency, but also as a comedian, I think that was really helpful for me because I've been used to this slightly aggressive tight 20 that I did, you know, in, in comedy venues where I thought, all right, I'm going to go out and come out fighting and yes. show you blokes, or mainly blokes actually at the time, but, uh, you know, that I'm like able to be funny. Yes. Whereas now I could relax and like, oh, if I can try out some stuff and actually they'll let, they won't boo me off if one joke doesn't because work. Because they already like you. Because they, they already That's like you. That's a huge difference. It's a huge difference for a comedian. Yes, I don't course. know about anyone else, how, how they're famous, how it affects them, but it's a tangible thing yeah. for a comedian is you think like, okay, I no longer have to be someone who proves that he's funny. They sort of think I am already. And it makes for a more relaxed stage live thing. Uh, and that was great. And I really like that. And I really liked... You know, I thought we did some great work in the Mary White's experience or whatever. And then, yeah, then mine and Rob's relationship went toxic and that became really hideous for a while. So you were still performing together, but you couldn't yeah. stand the sides of each other? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, actually, couldn't stand the sides of each other seems like strong. a weird thing, weird way of putting it, because I don't think I ever felt that about Rob. Rob may have felt it about me. Right. I don't think I couldn't, I can't why stand would the he, side Why of would him. he have felt it about you? Well, what, what happened was, was that Rob became... You know, and it's two sides of this story, I'm sure. But Rob became, un, from my point of view, unbelievably paranoid about sort of top billing, as it were, about sort of like... I think Rob felt, because he was by far the most beautiful one, and we had quite a lot of sort of female fans and all yes. that stuff, uh, that people might think, and I think Rob was, you know, at the time, was quite an insecure bloke, um, oh, because I'm the beautiful one. I mean, again, this doesn't like it's not that good for me anyway. This, but because I'm the beautiful one, people will think Dave is the clever one and oh, the sort gosh. of creative powerhouse. He's yes. got glasses. He's Jewish. Right. Um, people will think that, and that wasn't true. You know, basically, we, as far as I'm concerned, if you're in a creative partnership with someone, especially a comedy one, you're both doing what you're doing, and it's mm. a chemical thing that you've got together. And no one is really, especially when you're writing together, no one is really, you know, more responsible, less responsible. Oh, you course. have to accept that. Uh, but Rob became convinced that. Some people might not think that. So we had to change our name from Badil and Newman to Newman and Badil. Right. And then he became very obsessed with all that and very obsessed with, like, you know... Uh, so his, in his insecurities hurt you more than they hurt him in a well, way. Well, I didn't really mind it all at first when it was stuff but like... It oh, draining. You know, but after a while it became draining and then it became, like... My mistake was Rob decided as part of that that he wanted to be interviewed by himself. And so I said, well, all right then. And then journalist would interview me and I do have a problem with discretion and sort of I tend to just say what's on my mind so they would say oh how's it going and I would yeah. say oh I think he's gone mad right right he seems to have gone a bit mental yes. and that would then be in the paper then he would get really angry and then he would come and shout at me yeah and one time he, I remember him shouting and shouting at me and then another time him, him slagging me off on stage and blah 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 and after a while I thought I'm not enjoying this anymore can't do this anymore I'm not enjoying it but you had so much in I mean because you must have been making oodles of cash at the time so it's hard to walk yeah. away from or yeah. not I mean, we were doing well, yeah. and I, I don't know if I thought about the cash. I think I thought about what a shame it is that this really powerful creative partnership that is doing incredibly well on TV and live or whatever is going to come apart. But I, Rob as well, I'm sure, uh, wasn't happy. Couldn't hold it together. But I, I absolutely couldn't be in it any longer because yeah. it became about that primarily. Was it with you when you woke up in the morning? Were you waking up and yeah. thinking, oh, shit. Well, let me tell you a very short story. I know you want to get on to other stuff. But this is a this is how bad it got. We ended up we'd had one of these bust ups and we weren't speaking. And then we were doing Leicester de Montfort Hall, which is at like a three thousand seat venue. Space, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and Rob, I didn't watch his set by now. He didn't watch my set. And at the time, we were doing stand up and sketches, which we always did. It was yes. always not a complete double act, yes, as I yes, say. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, I did a new bit of material in my set. I went on first. And it was about the fact that the IRA at the time were not allowed to speak directly on the TV. They had to have their voices mm. malformed in some weird way. It was a weird Thatcher yeah. thing. Do you remember it? Yeah, of course. So, and lots of comedians have done jokes about it, but I did some joke about it. The joke I cannot remember in and of itself. But clearly, Rob had put a new bit of material in his set later in the second half about that. 
And I didn't know that. But meanwhile, he's off stage. He's standing there in his Jarvis outfit. Now, Jarvis was a character that was like a sort of lounge lizard, mm-hmm. sort of posh mm-hmm. man who just yes. talked about sex. Very funny character. He's standing there in that. He's about to come on as Jarvis and do a Jarvis bit. But as I go off, he hasn't, we haven't spoken for three days. He goes, you cunt, you fucking cunt. You knew I did a bit of material about that. You fucking cunt. Right? And then goes on. And then I go into his dressing room at half time and call him a cunt for yeah. about... 20 minutes. There's about seven journalists on this tour all writing feature <coughs> pieces about the new rock and roll. I mean, it's falling apart, is what I'm saying. And so we, I think we collectively decided we'll do Wembley, which was planned already, and, right. and that's it. And that was and, the... And lots of people said, oh, it's a publicity stunt. And it but wasn't. it really wasn't. It really wasn't, no. Uh, as, as, I mean, history has, has attested. Yeah. I bumped um, into him recently, and we were photographed recently. Yeah, I saw that. It was that. really nice to see him. Did, did you, had you missed him, or would that be the wrong word? Well, when I saw him, I thought, you know, he's he's a really funny bloke. Yes. I think he's an un, or unbelievable... When I worked with him, he's an unbelievable talent. Like, really incredibly wildly funny mm. and interesting and unusual and... Very uh, mercurial as well. Yeah, but go. brilliant, he's brilliant stand-up and, and also fucking hilarious writer. All that. Um, and when I saw him again, I just thought, oh, we actually really got on. Oh, that's You nice. know, and it was really yes. nice to see him again. But there had been some talk about, um, I can reveal this now, uh, when we were pictured together, it was at the Harper Collins, because we both write right. books now, yes. Harper Collins. So I, it was a picture of us looking really old, and I wrote, Com- <laughs> I wrote comedy is the old prog rock. Because <laughs> that's we looked like two old members of Genesis or something. And, and then Wembley got in touch. Wembley Arena got in touch Straight with up. my agents yeah. and said, 25 years, do you want to do a reunion gig? And I thought, well, I don't know what we'd do, really. Oh. But I thought, I'll ask Rob, and Rob yeah. just said no. Still. I'd ask Robert, do we want to chat about it? Robert yeah. said no. Not interested. Yeah. Door closed. Yeah. But then again, if he'd said yes, you might have you might have panicked cacked it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I, just... I just I would have thought if he'd said yes, I thought I had no idea what we we're gonna do. No, of course. You know, I mean, we could do history today and not even have to make up for it. <laughs> <laughs> you could do it straight. Yeah. Um and then what happened? Was because what when what, what was the gap between that and when you started working with Frank Skinner? About was that... two weeks. Was it really? You went straight yeah. off to, to... Yeah, because what happened was I'd become friendly with Frank. Um, and actually he was probably telling Frank about all this sort of very depressing stuff that's going on between me and Rob. Yes. Uh, and Fr- Frank Skinner has dark places in him as well. I mean, it's he, not... He, he certainly does. Yes. Uh, but uh, they're different dark yes. places. Yes. Uh, and they're not about that quite... There's not certainly not those kind of insecurities. No. Um, but uh, I... What happened with Frank was on the cabaret circuit, um, I had bumped into him a couple of times, and we'd bonded about football. I know that sounds cliched, but it was exactly what happened. Yeah. We were watching, I think it was uh, Egypt, Republic of Ireland in the 1990 World Cup backstage at Jonglers, you know that club? Mm-hmm. Um, I was still on the cabaret circuit in 1990. And uh, we started arguing, right? And I said, I can't bear the way they play. And he disagreed with me. But at the end of it, I thought, oh, he's quite a good bloke and he really knows about football. And apparently he thought the same thing. And then Frank split up from his girlfriend. He'd originally he'd already split up from his wife yeah. due to a very complicated Catholic issue. Right. Uh, he was very worried about all that to do with, I could tell you to explain the whole thing, but it would take another sure, podcast. Yeah. Uh, and he was in a bit of a state and he didn't have anywhere to live. And I had hardly met this bloke, but I said, oh, well, I've got a flat in Kilburn. My brother would move out. It's a box for a minute. You can go and stay there. Stay there for a couple of weeks. He stayed with me for six years. I never put the fucking rent up. He became, over that time, a regular on British television. Yes. I never put the rent up. 40 quid a week. <laughs> Which I'm not even sure he paid, to be honest. But we became very close. And then I stopped working with Rob. And just as it happened, I've been doing, I think it was on Radio 5, mm. they'd had a regular fantasy football. Not a, not a show, like no. our show, but just a league. Yes. And I was a member of the league. And as a result, the bloke who brought fantasy football to this country, uh, he called me up and he said, uh, do you think this could work on the telly? And I said, I don't know, maybe. And I spoke to Frank about it. And then we just created the show. And, and that was huge immediately. There was no slow yeah. burn with that, was there? No, it was very big. I mean, yes. in a very cult way, in sure. a very post-pub 90s way. But yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, and now would be huge because it like got three and a half million yeah. at sort of Friday night at yeah. 11 o'clock. It would be. Yeah. And that for someone of my age, that was, I mean, you were the two coolest dudes on telly at that point. That That's was, good. Um, yeah, well, it was a brilliant show to do. And it I ran mean, for a while brilliant. and you, you got to do the song and you know, with, with lightning seeds. And yeah. I mean, you were you were sort of king of football. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, you know, the song is a whole other thing. Uh, but... Uh, you know, people talk about. People ask me sometimes about you know my most, my proudest moment or whatever. I don't know if this proudest moment or whatever, but I do think that the moment that Three Lions was first sung at Wembley when yeah. I was there, which was a spontaneous happening, 
uh, because in that tournament, England hadn't done very well, had drawn with Switzerland, and then played Scotland, and the first yeah. half wasn't yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah. And then in the second half, basically, Gary McAllister missed a penalty. Then Gaza scored. Then the sun came out. And then a man who I will always be grateful for, but I don't even know the name of, the DJ at Wembley, against the FA's instructions, because they'd said, don't put that song on. It's it wasn't too, officially it's endorsed. Not the officially, or, yeah. official, it's, not, it's a bit partisan. Yes. Put it on anyway. And the whole crowd joined in. Like, without any sense that I had that they knew the words or anything. Oh, you know, man. You know, and it was literally the most extreme moment. Was Frank of, there? Yeah, you, yeah, Frank was together. next to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then girlfriends as well. Um, and Frank's girlfriend at the time was half German, I remember. But anyway, that's sort of around. <laughs> but, but the sense of hitting the spot, I suppose, with something that you had done, it's very rarely encapsulated in such a moment. You know, you do yeah, something and you hope it's going to work. You hope people are going to like there. it. And sometimes they do. Yes. And then you realise that gradually. A bit like I was talking about with noticing that me and Robert sold out this place. Like, yeah. oh, I see we're doing all right. Yeah, yeah. And, but with that, it was like wow, yeah. this explosion of people saying this is our thing. You know, and also we were really happy anyway because England had just won and yes, they were playing well. It's so the euphoria the of that is hard to imagine. You know, it's really hard to imagine. I remember the Holland game which is, you remember, we won 4-1 and the people were singing the song by then, like yeah, mental. Course, yeah. My manager saying to me, this is incredible. He said to me, <laughs> he said to me, if you win an Oscar, it won't be better than this. Now, I very much doubt I'm going to win an Oscar, but I sort of knew what he meant, yes. which is, it must be brilliant to win an Oscar, but at the end of the day, it's an industry thing. Mm. Whereas this really felt as close as you could get to the people. Yeah, and the zeitgeist, so, it, and yeah. it's you. And yeah. it, it must have been, it must have been so, phenomenal. Uh, we wrote those lyrics. Yeah. Yeah, we wrote those lyrics. And, and they are and brilliant lyrics. I, I, I think they are they brilliant really lyrics. Are. I think they are because they're vulnerable. Yes, I think exactly. that's the key element. And they capture the element, and it couldn't have been written by two people who weren't proper football players. You, no, couldn't, you couldn't have cobbled that together because you, you, you know, got a marketing success in another area, and they said, can you do as a football song? That, no. that was proper fans, and that's why yeah. it cut through so much. Yeah, well, I mean, Ian Brady... Whole, well, the music's brilliant, I think. It's yes, a it beautiful is. song. But also, Ian Brody had noticed that. Ian Brody uh, decided that he wasn't... I mean, he's a football fan. Yes. But he didn't feel quite equipped to write the lyrics. He was a big fantasy football fan. So he phoned me and Frank up and said... From his canal you... boat memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and said, can you write the lyrics? And we slightly cheekily said, can we sing it as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, And he went, well, all right then. <laughs> it's sort of amazing, really. But but that thing of, of like, yeah, it being us knowing what it means to yes. be an England football fan. Yes. Let's try and capture how that really feels. I don't think that would be number four with a football song. Even like the uh, New Order one, which a lot of people like, which I think sure. is a good song, it's not really a football song. No, and it's you know. much more studio-y. Yeah, I mean, it's, it yeah, it's a feel... great song, but it's, it's, it's a song, it's a love song, really, Yes, uh, with a John Bodds rap in it, whereas our the song John is Bob. about football. It's got yes. Gary Lineker's name yeah. in there, you yeah, know, yeah, Bobby yeah. Charlton's. Yeah. Um, and, I, and it did capture something, and it also it did something else, which I think maybe has gone away now, because of one of your favourite subjects, which is Brexit and yes. stuff, which is, I think we managed, if you go and watch the footage of that, you see loads and loads and loads and loads of people waving crosses of St George. Yeah. And we managed for a brief moment to create a type of English nationalism, yes. which didn't feel aggressive, triumphalist, racist. It felt vulnerable. Mm. It felt like, actually, you know, this is a great country, but maybe there's a way of singing about it and being it, which is not really aggressive and horrible. Yes. And for a moment, that was there, and now it's gone again. Seems to have done. Um, we, we're pretty much out of time, so we, we need to talk a little about the tour that you're going on yeah. with, with the show. Um, we've talked a lot about the show and the um, astonishingly intimate details that you share. I have a much better understanding of who you are now after after spending this time together and why this actually isn't a remarkable departure for you. or It isn't in any way a kind of change of direction. It is just you looking at the things you find most fascinating about yourself and your world mm. and trying to make sense of them through performing. So mm. it was the loss of your dad, clearly, that focused... No, my dad is still alive. So I, the loss of your mum, forgive me, that focused mm. your mind on on their relationship and your your family. Who was the first person that you told you might do a stage show about your mum's 20-year affair and your dad's dementia? My brother. And how did he um, react? <laughs> Not well, my, <laughs> not well at all. My younger brother, I was at the time I did it, uh, when I first decided I was definitely going to do it, I think I told my older brother in yes. London, but I then went off and so I, did, I did a discovery show in China. I did, I did this thing about the Silk Road. And so I'd written to my brother because he lives in New York. He's a cab driver in New York. Right. And I'd, I'd written to him and said, oh, look, I might be doing this. And he just wrote a one line thing saying, but you're not doing it. <laughs> you're not doing it. And uh, I still, oh, Christ, what's difficult about this is, I know that it's going to be a celebration. Yes. I know it's going to be come from love. 
and people aren't going to feel this is a trashing yes. of either of my parents. And it's, you know that absolutely, but you can't you know, necessarily articulate it. It's hard it until to explain it's it until you see the show. Of course. You know, and yes. so I had to say to both my brothers, you are gonna, I know neither of you want me to do this, yeah. but you're going to have to trust me. And now both of them do really like it. And I suppose the key moment was, uh, my younger brother hadn't seen it at this point, but I did it at the Chocolate Factory yes. first before I did it in the West End. And my older brother, I'd said to him, and I'm very, very close to my older brother, come and see the workshops. I did workshops at Soho Theatre. And if you don't like anything, you really don't like anything, I'll take it out. Don't know if that was true, but I said it anyway. Um, and he sort of avoided it. I think it was right. so, pretty soon after my mum died, like yes. only a few months, and I think he found the idea difficult. You were grieving. This is how you processed Well, definitely yeah. this is how I, I was dealing with my own grief. Yeah. She died very suddenly. So right. partly it was like trying to deal with this sudden absence and she didn't have that long coming to terms yes. with it thing. So uh, then he comes on the first opening night at the chocolate factory and there are loads of critics in the audience quite a small mm. theater i'm looking around i can see michael billington from the guardian and blah blah and i had a q a encore at that point which i've now stopped for various reasons just because i got the same questions every night and i got bored of it so i've changed it but then i had a q a and there's all these important critics i can see loads of them bloody quentin letts is there for goodness sake Great. all sorts of people and in a very me way, I said, look, I'm sorry if I alienate anyone with this, but I have to find out, first of all, what my older brother thought of this show. He didn't have his hand up. I was a bit worried. And I said, Ivor, what did you think? And he said, oh, I loved it. And then he said, I loved it because it felt like she was in the room. Oh. And it did make me cry on stage, but it made me realise something very important, which is the whole fucking show is saying, let's try and describe people who have gone, whether they've gone through death or gone through illness, it's as they actually are. If you do it as they actually are, if you hold to the truth, then even if those truths are negative, it's a celebration of who they are. Because people will come away thinking, oh, I really know who that person was. And that's what felt to me good about it. People have come up to me after the show and said, oh, I wish I'd met your mum. And what they mean is, I feel like I know who she was properly. So that thing that I started with was saying, when you say she's wonderful, you're basically raising her out of existence. Yeah. Let's try and be absolutely true about her and see where that gets us. I had achieved that. That was brilliant. Thank you, David. Thank you very much.